has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to all I have a joke for you. Okay. The government in this town is excellent and uses your tax dollars in addition. <laughs> Uh, Bitcoin is immune from attack or almost completely. With Bitcoin, you will actually gain far more from using that computing power to generate Bitcoin. There's a system approaching perfection. It's in time for a disappearance. There's a system approaching perfection. It's in time for a disappearance. We'll walk deeper into the belly of the beast. If it means I'm able to further limit reckless government spending. Well, hello, guys, and welcome to The Crypto Show. Uh, This is not a normal crypto show because it is, in fact, not a broadcast or live airing that is later to be recorded. This is uh, just a regular old internet podcast, and uh, we're excited to do this basically for the first time, and we're doing it uh, here on Sunday, October 11th, 2015, uh, the final day of the two-day conference of Liberty Fest NYC here in the heart of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York City, New York. And uh, we've had a pretty good time here. Uh, There's been some uh, ups and downs, a little craziness, mostly related to uh, the subway for uh, two guys who've never been to New York before and don't realize that the subway after 10 10 p.m. is different from the subway before 10 p.m. But, uh, oh, well, you know, sometimes the best lessons are learned the hard way. And uh, we're going to be interviewing uh, at least one guest, uh, a pretty cool one at that, and uh, probably more, hopefully, later on throughout the day. Um, I do want to mention a quick uh, a little statement I'd like to make. So, basically, there was... So, in, in, in Liberty, there is a difference, of course, of opinion, and not everyone agrees on everything, and there different shades of philosophical uh, thinking and interpretation and whatnot, and that's great. And that's all about the plurality and uh, diversity of uh, of our philosophy and what uh, free thinking is all about. But I will say, if anyone tells you, and I'm, I'm an anarchist, and it's there are people who are minarchists and constitutionalists, and they're all, uh, and I've been all three throughout my time, and they're all uh, liberty-minded, and they're all, going in the right direction, and they all uh, overlap 90%, and that's beautiful, and we can always discuss our differences, and that's beautiful too, but I will say, uh, never let anyone tell you that simply because you don't vote, or that because you're an anarchist, or that you because you don't believe in the system, that you're lazy, or uh, don't, and don't let them question why you're here, because I think one, that's a uh, uh, weird. Two, it's inappropriate. And three, I mean, I could probably uh, logically rip you to shreds. So uh, <laughs> certainly don't do that to me personally. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I just uh, there was a comment made earlier that upset me a little bit. You know, and of course, the presumption of voting is one. You know, there are inherent flaws to democracy in voting. Uh, optimally, democracy is incredibly flawed. Optimally, it's a majority of people oppressing a minority of people through an even tinier minority who theoretically will carry out the will of the majority. That doesn't even ever really happen. And that's a, the best case scenario, and it's terrible. The worst case scenario is a minority of people um, oppress everyone else. And really, everyone is a minority in one way or another on various issues or rights. And uh, that minority is the electorate or the pure unelected bureaucracy and they don't even carry out the will of the minority of people who are registered to vote who actually vote. And so that's also assuming that the voting system isn't rigged. And while, you know, people will say, well, you need evidence to claim that it's rigged. Well, no, you don't, because you need to prove to me that it's not rigged, because we just have this facade of a democratic system of voting. Uh, There's no a priori reason to believe that it is uh, open and honest and transparent. And so 
considering the fact that it's been around for a couple hundred years and considering the fact that billions and billions of corporate money get funneled into this system, it is ridiculous to think that the people who uh, you know run the government and run the corporations with billions and trillions of dollars at stake haven't figured out that instead of buying votes every year, you simply rig the system. So, uh, you know, I'd certainly love to uh, to have a chat one day on the show with the uh, person who made the comment earlier about people needing to get off the couch and vote because I, I just disagree with you. Anyway, uh, let, let's get to a lighter note. Oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. Pretty pretty metal, kind of rock. Who's that? Let's just say that our next guest has his own theme song. And uh, he was born that way. Yeah. Yeah, so let's let's get to something uh, more exciting and more fun and to a guy who uh, uh, seems like a really genuinely uh, nice person and uh, uh, intelligent and professional and uh, an entrepreneur. And uh, we're really excited to have him. Uh, just met him here at the conference. Uh, his name is uh, Anthem uh, Blanchard. Did I say that right? Yeah, Blanchard. 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 Uh, Blanchard. That's it. I knew that. I like to do the French. The Blanchard. You know? It sounds much more uh, je ne sais quoi. Je, oui, 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 oui. <laughs> uh, but at, uh, Anthem Blanchard, and uh, he is the president, CEO, and director of Anthem Vault. And uh, you're based out of Las Vegas? We so are, yeah. That, b- that, before that, you go any further, obviously Anthem and I are not oblivious as you are. This song that was just playing is called Anthem, Anthem by oh, Rush, yeah, right? right. Okay. No, and it just, it, I knew it sounded familiar, and then I got it when you said, I just wasn't, uh, it's been a while, okay? <laughs> I'm used to hearing the more uh, common radio right. uh, Rush, so. Um, I just appreciate you not playing the Zar Spangle Banner, so that's. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, absolutely. Well, um, Anthem, um, I hope you don't mind. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and if you don't mind sharing with the, uh, our listeners what you shared with me before about how uh, you got your name. Yeah, I'd love to, Chris. So uh, just to just touch upon uh, it, Liberty Movement, Anthem Hayek Blanchard is uh, the name that I was given by my parents. So named after the novella by Ayn Rand, eh, named after the Austrian uh, economist, Nobel Prize winner, Frederick August Hayek, who was a, a very huge advocate for the denationalization of money. And the idea that government should not control money and have certainly not have a monopoly on money. So. Uh, that, that, that is the namesake. So uh, basically, I guess you could say I've been indoctrinated in uh, libertarian doctrine for <laughs> my entire existence. Well, so. I hate to use the word indoctrinated. <laughs> and, and even though maybe in a technical way that's true, just like, you know, we technically use propaganda. It can be good for good, though. Uh, but I just like to say that your, your parents were smart and they cared about you. Yes. And they were wise to uh, raise you up in a tradition and philosophy that uh, promoted uh, uh, further wisdom on your part. So that's really awesome. I, I appreciate it. And lots of love, too. I mean, I had the best parents. They adopted me, so it was a choice. Aww. So it was a uh, very, very lucky, uh, lucky individual. So, Absolutely. But I, I, I hear what you're saying, Chris. And, you know, definitely, it's, uh, I think it's important to recognize, you know, in, in any event, you know, and, uh, too, being too idealistic. It's wonderful, I think, to follow one's ideals, but I think – where things get a little dangerous is if you get too idealistic and, and become an ideologue, then, then sometimes, it, even as a libertarian ideologue, then we can maybe end up in the same place as a Marxist ideologue because right. neither are necessarily grounded in reality. So I think that's where I think it's something that I'm always ever cognizant of and try to always want to put the, the rubber to the road and actually be a, a person of action, I think. And, right, and, and, and that, I agree and, with that. And, and, and that's really where I think, okay, what can we do to best be at people of action? Let's be value creators and, and whatever it is that we do, be entrepreneurs or building and, 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 and doing things that are additive to other people and add enjoyment to other people's lives. So Absolutely. Uh, I think that ultimately is the most effective activism of all. I mean, definitely it's great to educate people and 
you know, get the word out and get kind of people understanding, okay, what is it to be, um, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a free-minded individual and, and always wanting freer and freer and getting, you know, less and less government and, and minimizing government as, as much as we can, as quickly right. as we can. So in any event, so, you know, kind of getting to the practical, uh, Anthem Vault is our company and it's a vaulting service that uh, makes gold and silver as a starting point accessible to the world, you know, ultimately uh, making all assets accessible to the world. Uh, we created a gold currency uh, called Hayek Gold in May. Um, we uh, actually, it was so popular that the the, uh, the treasury came out in August and issue, issued a ruling that said that a, a gold-backed Bitcoin, which is what Hayek Gold is, um, in, in effect, um, needs to be registered as, that we need to be registered as a money service business. So, Wow, you're kidding. And oh, so yeah. they, they specifically singled you out for your... Well, that's not exactly how so the rulings won't specifically mention a company. And so but in terms of the activity of the company, it was literally gold tokens. But it along se it seems likely, though, that they were responding to what your service you were bringing up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So but in this perverse world that we live in, it, it's very the irony to me is that so we, we raised a, a round of funding, uh, 1.6 million. Now we're going out and raising another round of capital and actually going to institutional investors. They prefer that we actually get more regulated and they like the idea that there's this regulation. So I'm just, well, and I you know, that up. it's kind of perverse. It right? is perverse. So, and, uh, you know, I want to make a quick comment on that. You know, there's a lot of people uh, who are statists, especially in the left, who uh, love regulation. And what they don't understand is that there's no such thing as an unregulated market. It's simply whether the market does the regulating or the state does. And when we say that the market regulates, we don't mean a corporation regulates itself. We mean other corporations regulate other corporations and uh, consumers regulate corporations, employees regulate employers and vice versa and all that big mix. And so I think that's an important point. And I think it's interesting that you say that because that is just one uh, further demonstration among many that uh, big companies uh, not necessarily always nefariously, but they like regulation because regulation actually tends to benefit uh, existing large companies uh, from the competition that could exist if there weren't barriers to entry being raised by that regulation. But anyway, let's get back to the topic. For sure. So um, Anthem Vault. And so they recently basically decided that you should, the treasury, you said, that you should be registered as a, was it a financial services company? It's, it's, or called, was, it's, it's called the money service business. Money service so business. It, so the beautiful thing is, you know, clients can still, so we have about 5,000 accounts and our clients love to buy and sell gold and silver, kind of like a stock or a savings account, but eliminate the whole bank aspect. So the client owns the asset outright, and which is huge, huge legal distinction. So it's just the same as legally owning something in a self-storage unit, for example. Uh, you own that asset as yours, or owning a piece of real estate. Let's say you own, you know, uh, myself and two buddies went out and bought real estate. We each would own a third of that real estate undivided. So same legal in interest uh, understanding with Anthem Vault. It's all, all the metals held at Brinks and Salt Lake and, and Lloyd's of London underwritten. and. Um, you know, it, it's it's basically a case where um, you know, we allow people to basically buy as little as twenty five dollars, sell as little as a dollar's worth of the the, the most uh, valuable insured form of gold um, imaginable and silver imaginable. So, um, it's so just, it makes it accessible to a lot of people because traditionally exactly. you'd probably have to have a, a base minimum amount of money to really invest in, in, in that kind of thing. And, and this is, is it, on a this is on a coin, right? And we're, what type of crypto is it? it? This is, so the, the platform is, is a closed platform as a base. So that is not, it's a fractional metal ownership platform. Now the crypto that we've hooked onto it, which is an open platform, it's a uh, high gold is, uh, it, it runs along Bitcoin's blockchain and it's inserted into Bitcoin's blockchain through counterparty. So for your more technical listeners, that's the, the technicalities mm -hmm. of it. So uh, the Hayek actually does run along uh, Bitcoin or we have it off to our clients right now as we get all the proper licensing and registration. But and counterparty, able... sorry, counterparty is what allows you to create your own cryptocurrency, basically. Right? That's correct. A counterparty you can think of almost like a stock exchange or like an exchange type setup or, or, or platform that hooks uh, directly into Bitcoin, but it can actually hook into any other ledger as well. And, so, and the name, what's the name of the, the coin? Uh, it's Hayek, Hayek Gold. So HayekGold.com is actually where listeners can go. We have a you know great website up there. It's actually going 
going to be um, right now we're, we're still playing around with it it's going to be fully integrated into your anthem vault account so you can basically see like a condensed version of the anthem vault account it's basically to showcase our move to getting to this wallet so people can have a gold wallet that they can spend again having to go through the very quiznotic uh, steps of having to go through all of the 48 u.s states i believe that have money service business wow. licenses so yeah clients can still buy we have you know account holders i believe in like i think 100 countries or some odd so we can take care of clients from 100 countries so you, so. you've been active or how long have you actually been active yeah, so taking we, clients been, we took our first order december of 2012 so we've been oh, around, so you've been for around. A while. oh yeah okay, we, we, cool. we, we've had some staying power here uh, we were founded in february of 11 so it doesn't restrict a client's ability to buy from us it just it just restricts them to use the metal as a currency right now um, we actually also intend to offer a centralized and decentralized option for payments so that way people need can to choose connect, need to connect it to shapeshift i like shapeshift uh, eric for mm -hmm. uh really impressive entrepreneur so oh, he's great yeah, we've had him on the show he's a very intelligent man definitely nice, nice. yeah i like what they're doing well uh, i want to get into uh, a little bit more of the specifics i want you to uh explain Kind of take us through the process of it in a second, but just to get it out there, of course, you said they can go to uh, Anthem. Yeah, AnthemVault.com is our main website. That's really where if they want to, you know, first, that's the best place to start, I would say. Um, anyone that's particularly interested on the crypto specific, HayekGold.com is the name of that website. So Hayek Gold, so for short, a Hayek. Um, being <laughs> yeah. the unit of account, a Hayek being a gram of gold that uh, is a, a gram of gold exchangeable into an Anthem Vault account. So okay. each Hayek is a gram. Um, where there's no degradation. So in other words, there's no uh, what they call demurrage or uh, a fee, like a storage fee every month that's paid. It's all upfront charge. So, so it's a one-time fee is what it, you're saying? Exactly. So it keeps the accounting simple so you don't have to <laughs> think about, oh, there's going to be like a uh, some kind of fee that's taken every month for storage. So it keeps the accounting simple in people's minds. So, awesome. And you have a promotion uh, going on too, right? Yeah. It looks like if you go to the website, you can type in the promo code James Blanchard. Mm -hmm. And if you do that using the green sign up button to create an account, you get six months free storage and 15% off dealer's margin for life. Yeah, and yeah, that, 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 that's correct, Chris. Actually, um, we'll go to, yeah, hit sign up, and I think it, it's actually sign up by email. I think I have an old card, I've got to, uh, uh, but I think, I don't know if the button's still green, but make sure to sign up by email, and then yeah, James Blanchard, and it's just one string, so no space in between, and yeah, it'll, it'll entitle you to six months free storage, and I think, what, 15% off of our spread margin, so. That's, that, that's a really lucrative offer. And there's no minimum, so you can just open the account for free, let it sit there. And you know, we're constantly innovating you know, new developments. Unfortunately, sometimes government regulation requires us to take one step back as we get compliant. But right. one thing I want to assure all your listeners, and even as a frustrated you know, anarcho-capitalist out there and libertarians or what have you out there, the bottom line is that we live in the world we live in, and as even though as we try to educate people and affect positive change for more liberty and individual individualism, the reality is is that we still live in a world that's very constrained by regulation and laws. And the unfortunate reality is, unlike even like a Schofield law of uh, Uber or Airbnb, in financial services, the the teeth of the the the, the, the fines and penalties of imprisonment are they're criminal. So. It, it, it's a whole uh, another level of um, restrictiveness. Right. I guess you could it's say. not simply so, uh, administrative or uh, you know civil. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. Exactly. Civil, even keeping on more of a state level, because once you start getting into the Patriot Act, and now you're talking about federal, so we never want to put our clients' value in danger. And I know that that's been something that has happened in the U.S. I mean, they, I don't want to get into that too much, but you know, there have been other digital. Um, gold currencies out there, for example, that were based in the U.S. that struggled, and yeah, you know, I, I th uh, my opinion was personally, it like BitGold. Yes, there was well, gold. Uh, uh, there was um, uh, e bullion and e gold, and actually, you know, gold money. I worked with, and they, we actually did things above board, and that's why they're still around. So, like Liberty Dollar, I have a lot more sympathy for Liberty Dollar, but still, there were things that were done there that just they turn the other way to specific U.S. code, and it's just not a wise decision. Right, it's and, not, and that's the thing. It's not inherently immoral because just because you yeah. don't follow the law doesn't mean you're 
breaking moral law. But like you mentioned, you know, we live in the world we live in. You got to play the game to some extent. And I definitely agree with that. You know, I think I, we uh, recently talked to Josh Kigali or Sigali from uh, Volturo. Um, how is how is Anthem different from Volturo? I know they keep theirs in Switzerland. Uh, yeah. Do you have like a different service than them? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so why not? There are differences between their pros and their advantages and disadvantages to holding value outside the U.S. The, the advantage, and it's good to hold some value outside the U.S. too. Yeah, diversification, hedge your bets. But, yeah. you know, it, I mean, I would say arguably, I mean, again, I, I like what Voltoro is doing, so I don't want to diss on them too much. Mm-hmm. But it's more like uh, I think if you're going to go international, at least for me personally, I would just stay international. So go with a company that's outside of the U.S. to then store outside the U.S. That so makes that way sense. You avoid. I think. I mean, I don't want to get in any. I like because I like what they're doing. But yeah. to, that that that's, I think they are. Aren't they outside the U.S. or? Uh, I thought they were in the U.S. Maybe they are outside the U.S. I, I wasn't part of that Texas. interview. Actually, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where. Well, they either are, way, but, I mean, but, but, people but, should look but, into it. And if they're one thing, if well, they're based in the U.S., I think you're right. If mm-hmm. you're gonna have it outside the U.S., it's probably better with so, a so, non-U.S. So, so that's based great. If, they, if that that is they're doing another just consideration. If you are a U.S. citizen, you technically have to report to to forms every year with your taxes right one with your taxes one by june 30th it's fincen 113 it's a treasury form and i think form 8938 i'm not a cpa by the way out there Ta- consult your tax <laughs> filing professional you know and or cpa on this but i can tell you from my personal experience that's what i've had to do um, if you have over ten thousand dollars outside in a foreign financial account or actually even an investment as equity in a company. So wow. the, the, so just keep that in mind. I mean, that, that, that's one of those things where a lot of people won't realize that, that are in the U.S. And the unfortunate thing is that they ever got audited, the fines on that would be Pretty tens huge. of thousands of wow. dollars. Could likely. wipe you so, out basically in your investments. Exactly. So it's one of those things like for people, I mean, our service is meant I mean, $25 minimum. Mm-hmm. They can sell as little as a dollar's worth. I mean, we have very large accounts too, but it's meant, it's meant to accommodate, you know, the multimillionaire and the everyday person. So and people have different preferences and risk profiles and they yep. need to do their own research as well as listening to informative talks like this. So Volturo could be for some people. Uh, Anthem could be for a different uh, set of people both. as well. well or I would both. Say both. Could, I would there say potentially, could there potentially be uh, kind of a situation where you guys teamed up or yeah. you could be gold on one end and they could be gold on the other end and you could actually use digital currency to transfer gold without ever... I think that that's a very astute comment and that those are things that we're thinking about very seriously about having kind of... Um, co-op kind of uh, models that we could have interchangeability. Um, you know, one thing that we are really, we're really, really focused on seeing, you know, gold ultimately and other, all of their assets be able to circulate as currency, whether it's a cryptocurrency or whether it's a physical asset that's hooked into a cryptocurrency. So, you know, that, that I would say is one way how we differentiate ourselves a little bit from, you know, some of the other just pure like hold gold and then like attach it onto crypto somehow. So, you know, uh, Walter is based on Bitcoin, right? It right. rides on Bitcoin. Exactly. Exactly. So in our case, it's that, you know, it's, it's having gold and that as gold as a payment, if it's a decentralized option, then the gold rides along Bitcoin to pay people with um, once we get the license. But ultimately, I think I think there are actually some some people like centralized payments because especially if you make them free or really cheap because they might not want to, it's something to be publicly disclosed um, or, you know, they're, they're, they're just okay with that because it's a small enough transaction. It's not a big enough deal. They just want the, the ease and the freeness because really Bitcoin transactions are not that cheap if you want to do them quickly and you haven't sent before to someone that you know is trusted necessarily. So, I mean, it can take a while and it takes some Bitcoin if you want to get a, you know, a, a confirmed transaction, right? So right. it's not, you know, necessarily, I mean, I, I think that's what some of the scaling aspects, you know, were, that, you know, obviously gotten a lot of chatter. And I was on Bloomberg, for example, talking about Bitcoin XT and why I didn't particularly, even though I, I'm for scaling Bitcoin for sure, but I just wasn't for that particular implementation. And so, um, you know. Bloomberg wants to reduce the size of the block limit, oh. just like they reduced the size of the soda that he reduced the size of the sodas in New York. That was a bad joke. Or, or yeah, 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 exactly. Well, <laughs> well it was funny actually, because yeah, actually, uh, yeah, it was it was on with um, you know, Emily Chang and Bloomberg West, and and there were a couple other uh, uh, pundits on the show, and I think there was a lot of misunderstanding or kind of thinking that oh, 
if we don't scale Bitcoin right now, then it's going to be like Y2K, right? Nothing's going right. to work. And we have to, I mean, that was the examples that were given or like Facebook and then it's not going to adjust and it's going to get left behind. Then you say, okay, well, yeah, I actually agree with some of that because like a lot of what's being said at this conference, for example, microtransactions, what's well, like practically speaking, it's like, yes, if you don't need to have to trust them or, you know, unconfirmed transactions, but for real confirmed transactions where you know that someone's not gaming you, I mean, it is a little, it's, it's a lot more expensive, quite mm -hmm. frankly. So it's, I think there's a need to uh, scale and, and increase the number of transactions in the block somehow. I mean, I, I, I'd like to see, I like that there's more proposals coming out. These yeah, we, coming mm -hmm. out and a lot of different great. opinions too. And, and uh, there's a lot of uh, dimensionality to it. Like uh, we had people like Peter Todd, uh, and others talk about how it's more than just the block size limit that is at issue in this stuff. But I mean, it's a separate topic, but we can uh, maybe delve into that some other time. Well, but, the, uh, the nodes too, you know, I mean, I think that that was one of my other big kind of questions is, you know, how can you scale with it, but still have a decentralization, right? Because the nodes, it takes, you know, so much. Um, you know, they're so big in order to get, you know, all of the, the entire blockchain into right. the node. So, so that can lead to it sounds centralization. Uh, it sounds like what you're dealing with, it would be a pretty good match for uh, what Chris Odom is doing at Stash Crypto. Hmm. You'll have to... Let's check that out. Yeah, get in Let's touch with Tim or we can get you in touch Thank with you. him. But but let's awesome. um, uh, let's kind of get back. You know, I, we really still haven't touched on just exactly how it works. And, yep. uh, I mean, a, a lot of good information thus far. So, I guess... It, and, and forgive me if, if I'm asking for clarification that shouldn't be necessary because it was already explained. But so the each Hayek, uh, each Hayek coin or a Hayek, which is uh, equivalent to a gram of gold. Yeah, so it's basically a claim on stored gold uh, somewhere. You said in uh, what, what were the two it's locations? A, Salt Lake City. It's just in the U.S. right now. Okay. So we, we're thinking about, you know, possibly vaulting out of the U.S. or, you know, we're definitely looking at a lot of other U.S. locations. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of figuring out do we want to go that path or do we want to partner up with other people that right. you know have already have that in place so is it so then is uh, i guess what i'm asking is it pretty similar to, to to traditional investments in which you uh basically invest in a claim on actual physical gold stored in a vault essentially correct that's the core product so the and what's the what's the innovation what's the advantage though yep. why, why can't we can't they just go to I don't know, JP Morgan or whoever and, and do that with them. What's the advantage with using you guys? So a big advantage is that we're not a bank and that none of our vault operators are, which currently just one, are banks. We will never use a vault operator that's a bank. So that means that there's no credit risk because you own the asset. So you own the claim outright. There's no liability between you and the claim. So uh, we serve just as like a, a, a vaulting facility. So it's regulated differently. In a sense, it's, so well, yeah, the or it's treated differently legally. Exactly. Is what you're saying? That's correct. It's yeah. treated differently as far as an asset is concerned. Correct. That it's, makes more sense now because correct. I see instead of a liability, which is what happens when you have a bank deposit or an ETF in a brokerage account, because there's a holding bank there. There's a reason why they have SIPC insurance or FDIC insurance claims because technically you don't own that cash any longer when you make the bank deposit. You know, you have there are other liabilities. When you have an ETF at a holding, you know, holding bank with a brokerage account, it's very complex. So we take the complexity of the banks and, you know, is there any like, is there someone between you and your money, you and your gold or you and your value? In, in our case, no, we're just a vaulting company that's a facilitator. So we have a accounting system that enables you know, gold to be spliced to a 10, a 10 billionth of an ounce um, and, you know, allows it to then function. Uh, and financial services because you can't use a gram ingot or a yeah. 10 ounce bar functionally. Yeah, you, it's not divisible um, quickly and electronically. So right. first you have to make it divisible and you have to be able to comply with the regulation. Mm -hmm. And then you can and then you can basically, you know, keep adding new features and, you know, innovation always is ahead of regulation. And it's a two steps forward, one step back. And but the cool thing is, is that every we, we launched the first fully gold backed cryptocurrency last July as like it was an X11 script, the same as Dark Coin and uh, 10 million uh, Independence Coin, INN Coin, uh, redeemable for a gram of gold, 100,000 redeemable for a gram, 10,000 redeemable for a tenth of a gram in an Anthem Vault account. And we doubled our account size uh, in Q3 of last year, Hyatt Gold, uh, once we released it um, in May. 
I mean, we, we did our biggest month ever in May of account Do you want size. So. throw out any numbers? That, wait, uh, wait uh, what was the transition from Amagi Metals? Uh, how did that work? Oh, yeah. So uh, Amagi, so, yeah, we uh, we were approached with, um, you know, Amagi was, um, you know, just kind of looking to transition and had experienced some distress. Um, and I always really admired um, what Amagi had built up and, uh, like, their kind of what they stood for, the product mix that they got so involved in the crypto community. And it was a, it was an opportunity for us to kind of get back to my legacy, our legacy roots, and family created the what became the largest gold coin company in the world, Blanchard and Company that they sold to like GE back in the your 80s. family. So yeah, wow, I didn't yeah. know that. That's cool. My dad's big claim to fame was helping to uh, eliminate the prohibition um, against gold ownership. So and it was oh, illegal wow. from 1933 through 74. So right. so yeah, so that was kind of the background. So getting back to the legacy business and. Um, also being able to incorporate uh, crypto since they you know, really did a great job of really being huge advocates. So you know, the idea is that we think we can increase the number of accounts faster through um, bringing in this new business line because people are familiar with coins or more familiar with like a physical drop ship gold or silver item or precious metal item, for example, or metal item for that matter, than they are a, a fractional metal ownership or some, a crypto metal um, you know, a crypto asset that was tied to a, a metal, for example. Well, and speaking of which, uh, so I have a couple, at least a couple other questions. Um, so, um, one, get into um, what happens kind of worst case scenario. Like, it's, let's say, what risk do people have in ever losing their gold? Um, and you, we talked about how legally this is structured differently as far as, uh, you know, an asset or property is concerned, which is a pretty big difference. It is a huge advantage, I think, to what you're doing. But uh, in a second, get into what could theoretically go wrong, just so people mm -hmm. are aware of that. But then also, um, if, if I... Um, if I have a bunch of Hyatt gold um, mm -hmm. and I want to take my gold, demand my gold for delivery, is that possible? Yeah. So, so yes, it is possible. I, uh, clients can take delivery. It's all it's kilo bar gold, one thousand ounce silver. Um, you know, practically speaking, um, you know, someone could you know technically use the gold to pay to buy a smaller item once we get the the, the payment features back you know back on, but. You know, practically speaking, it's uh, you want to stay with at least kilo size and thousand ounce silver because, like right now, hundred ounce not silver is very obviously. difficult. What's also difficult to get when 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 there's a big demand run like there right. like there has been the last couple months. So, going it, it it gives you the most metal for your money because you're buying parts of like the largest most liquid bars. So, but. Um, you know, so, so, so a kilo bar is about $35,000. Anyone can actually, that's a client, if they give us notice and then they have to go through Brinks protocol, but it's like ID verification, they can actually see the metal themselves. So in terms of what can go wrong, I, mean, I would say the biggest one would be is if we did see a confiscation of metal again in the U.S. Um, now, I'm of the opinion that there's a lot more low-hanging fruit. I, mean, I think legally that's the case because you've seen it before with uh, like in, in, in Cyprus, for example, and other countries. Because banks are government chartered, and because the accounting is that the bank technically owes all that owns all that's in that's held with it, basically, or even if technically things are held in custody and they should be off balance sheet, there's still a lot of murky questions about in a real um, you know insolvency event what would happen. Probably those assets would get encumbered. In other words, you would probably lose some of your value at the bank. So. Right. You know, my view is that, you know, IRAs, um, you know, uh, pensions, uh, pensions and, all yeah. of these other type of uh, investment instruments that are, are, are definitely have tie ups with the government somehow or where there are encumbrances. They're ultimately. more accessible and they're more liquid for the government to seize anyway. It's lower so. hanging fruit from yeah. a rule of law standpoint. I mean, I, it'd be very, very, I mean, we would be completely... I mean, that would be done, basically, because that would be the end of property rights. And I would argue that that pretty much is the end of, uh, of the economy and, and trade frankly. and everything. I mean, if it yeah. gets that bad, I mean, yeah, I mean, what, what, if you don't have property rights, then. Well, then head for the hills you, at that what point. What do you got? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Nothing <laughs> taken away from you. So, And um, so what, what happens if Anthem Vault were to face bankruptcy or insolvency? Uh, yep. What would happen in that? Good. 
Great question. So in that case, the client's assets would, they'd have the option to either take delivery of the metal if they'd like to, uh, or sell the metal and receive the proceeds. So because none of the assets are on our balance sheet, then like no creditors, there's no, there's no like, access to any of those funds because so legally no one who would get in ours. line before them. I see exactly. So because it's the client's value, so it's there's no, there's no legal you know ownership to any of these assets by you know any any creditor. So gotcha. it's uh, you know that and that's all defined in the terms of service and that it, which we made as short and sweet and uh, sweet and concise as we could as the, the lawyers would allow us to basically state states out that. Clients own a portion of an undivided interest in a, a part of gold, so a portion of gold. And there's been enough fractional metal ownership platforms around now, and they're, they're concurrently there are ones out there all over the world that U.S. citizens have accounts, and even if they're not based in the U.S., that there's been enough legal precedent there that I, I feel pretty comfortable that like all of the fractional metal ownership type law would hold up. So, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think confiscation risk. Yeah. I mean, if there's the insolvency risk with us, it's, that's the, that's the big difference. One of the big differences between us and a bank, um, or a financial institution where, uh, the assets could get encumbered. Um, right. you know, I mean, it, you know, in the U S it's, you know, so far as the FDIC and the government's kind of been able to shuffle around enough paper and been able to kind of handle insolvent banks like we saw seven, eight years ago. But, and, you know, as there's more and more bailouts and with every subsequent credit crisis and every subsequent bailout, eventually there's going to be a bail in because eventually yeah. the government will figure, well, if it gets that big, then they'll, they'll really, really get worried about hyperinflation and say, right. okay, well, you know, we can only bail out so much and the rest of it's going to have to get bailed in. And that's when you see Cyprus and Greece scenarios happening right. on a much larger scale. That's true. Cause the do, you, do, do you have any plan of expanding into other metals or other commodities, other commodities? Yes, most definitely gold and silver just made sense to start with because they're recognized global stores of value number one. And also because uh, the regulators and also the financial institutions kind of know how to deal with it already. So it's like pretty well defined as opposed to like crypto assets, for mm -hmm. example, right? Where it's like, yeah, I, I seen a pretty interesting company, I guess, out of Switzerland called Swiss Metals, and they've got like 30 different kinds of metals. Some of them oh, I've never wow. even heard of, and you just, uh, yeah. I guess you buy it and they store it for you there. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. We've actually, yeah, yeah, know those guys. I like mm -hmm. what they're doing, and, and I, yeah, we, we actually, yeah, um, yeah, we're definitely planning on expanding. I mean, there's 90 plus metals on Earth, and some of them are a lot harder to vault than others, but there's no reason why someone couldn't have a fractional ownership and a piece of, you know, plutonium technically, as long as it's stored <laughs> properly. I mean, you couldn't take delivery of it, but, right. or you could, but not, you know, not to your house, but. So if Doc know. Brown needed plutonium for his time machine, like you guys could offer that? Well, I don't, I, I don't know about facilitating from an, in, an industrial standpoint, but oh, I mean, okay. well, well I, I guess technically, hey, why not? I mean, eventually if you get the right delivery arrangements, it's just about have, going to the right country that would even allow that yeah. if there would be any right yet, of course. <laughs> right. so, but. I mean, th there's nothing from a technological standpoint that you know doesn't. You can make that happen in a in a way that's not going to put anyone in personal harm, and, right? And you know, have it done in a, in a much more liquid way. So, well, yeah. and, a, and a couple more questions. I don't want to keep you. I know you. We've been a long interview already, and I really appreciate your time. And uh, it's very informative. But um, uh, one, um, and maybe I missed it. Is this also intended to be the Hyatt Gold uh, also meant as a currency? On top of being uh, uh, claims on real physical gold, and then two kind of what assurances you know outside of uh, bankruptcy or insolvency do people have that you're not, for instance, producing way more claims than you have in actual gold? Yeah. So great question. So yeah. So high. So high gold. So it's it's a, a functionally a payment system or currency. It's a be a decentralized virtual currency technically. So yeah, it's a payment mechanism. And ultimately, through that accessibility, through development, innovation, you know, we want people to be able to to make it as liquid as possible, as usable as possible, and just you know whether it's lendable, payable, you know, spendable in any other way, sellable in any other way, and other currencies, other assets, you know, all of it. So 
In terms of assurance on, on Anthem Vault, so additional steps that we take that we aren't required to from any government statutorily is number one, we are audited every year by uh, AI, CPA, PCAOB member company. And what, tight. what that means, yeah, for <laughs> in English, what that means is that it's the same like accreditations of like those associations that in order for the auditing company to be accredited to audit publicly traded companies. Or, so that's, that's one aspect. We have a bar um, count that we actually publish on the front of the website. So it lists the bars that are in the vault. So at least people can see, okay, here are the bars. And again, as mentioned, technically, if they want to, if they give us a little notice and we can facilitate and they have an account with us, we can facilitate them, uh, you know, taking taking a visit to the vault themselves. So they can visit or even take delivery, like you said. Yeah. And yep. it isn't strictly allocated in the traditional sense, right? It's not like they, because you're doing gradations that are so uh, f small and fine, it's not like you have numbered bars, but then it doesn't really need to be because you don't have those, phys you're not getting you're not making claims on individual bars that are big anyway. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. So exactly, because title, it's title and an undivided interest in a pile of bars is, is legally okay. how your interest is set out in the terms of service. So it's not a pooling Just account. for further clarification, that's good, yeah. Yeah, so, it, it's, yeah, so, so, so legally it is an asset that you own, but it's not, it's not allocated, segregated on a per unit Basis, just right? like you said, a company with three shareholders, like a, or real right. estate, right? Or like real a piece estate, of real estate, yeah. and there are three people that that own, or four people that own it, and that they, but they, they don't an undivided interest. So, you know, it'd, it'd be different if it was parceled out. But if it wasn't parceled out, and say, okay, we're just buying it as you know, investment in a piece of land. That's a really great easy example. Or house, you know, or cash flow income. Okay. Like we all own that cash flow four ways. We all own the, the underlying, you know, real estate four ways. So awesome. You know, it's, and uh, um, oh, I guess oh, one thing though, I guess before we close out, um, this is going to be on the let's talk Bitcoin network, of course. So there's going to be a magic word. Would, do you want to pick the magic word? Wait, we actually picked the magic word? No, oh, we'll let Anthem pick them. Are you yeah. familiar with the LTV uh, can, platform? Can we, can, we, can we make it uh, Hayek? There you go. Yeah. The, say the magic word is Hayek. The magic word is Hayek. And Heck spell yeah. it. You have to spell H -A -Y -E -K. it. H-A-Y-E-K. See, I, I guess that makes sense that we came up with the magic word. Where did you come up with forum, that last one? Uh, because Roger Ver was on it, and we were discussing the Roger Ver. Oh, Ver's forum. that's right. That's right. I forgot about that. Cool. Well, um... Uh, Excellent. I thought there was a fine. Oh, uh, final question. Um, what um, what other products or services? Uh, you know, you had talked about the possibility of expanding into other metals. Do you have any other products or services that you're also working on that you want to mention? Uh, you know, we we've got a like lending, um, you know, peer to peer lending platform that we had built and then uh, kind of just haven't deployed. Just uh, that's one. You know, car product is something that we've gotten a lot of more questions about it. I'm not. I mean. Card's fun and interesting, but it's more of a novelty, I think, because at the end of the day, like you really should be saving, I think, any assets that are going to be, you know, more valuable. I mean, if, if people have to legally take pieces of script and paper and that's how you're getting paid, then in my opinion is you might as well use them and pay them out. And the Gresham's Law is what they call that. Right. And people good hoard money the good chases money out bad, and, they, yeah. and they spend the bad money. Or, so, or vice versa, sorry. And ultimately, if there's a banking crisis, the debit card is not going to do you any good because all of that runs through the banking system. So right. from a practical standpoint, I mean, it's neat because it gives you another outlet out. So in that, it's, so it, it's congruent with our you know, mission of making you know, the assets more accessible to everyone and making the assets themselves as accessible in, in and of themselves for their, for our clients. So it fits, but just want to point out, I mean, it, it's not quite as uh, the most unfortunate. The right. most unfortunate thing here is that he can't connect with Ricky in the trailer park. And put some hash coins on there. I still he makes these <laughs> references all the time. I still haven't seen this show. So for the longest time he would say stuff I no no idea what he was talking about. Then it turns out it was all from uh, Trailer Park Boys. But anyway, well, um, Anthem Blanchard uh, of Anthem Vault, we really appreciate it. Um, Likewise. Likewise, you know, just yeah, to round it out, like what we kind of started out talking about. Um, you know, uh, there is a sort of limit to idealism, but uh, I think what and we do need to be practical. But I think those really go hand in hand. I mean, I think the two forms that are most practical, the two uh, uh, things you can take action to do uh, beyond voting and involving oneself in the political system is 
entrepreneurship, like you said, and uh, things like agorism, you know, building uh, parallel institutions and, and other sort of voluntary means. I still in education, though, too, because ultimately the government itself is not an entity. Uh, that's separate and you know sort of indivisible it's basically a construct within the minds of many people and the more minds you change the, the more you diminish the actual power of the government but entrepreneurship is one way of doing that and I was talking with Jeffrey Tucker yesterday you need how... to stop watching the matrix <laughs> <laughs> I, I almost made a matrix quote earlier on when we were talking about this it's funny you say that but uh, it's a great movie and it's very applicable even if it's cliche just because it's cliche doesn't mean it's not true uh, but you know we're, I was talking to Jeffrey Tucker one thing I've realized is uh, as important as it is to educate and change minds uh, there are many people where that's not going to be possible in part because their own belief system is based on emotion and not rationality so one thing you can do with things like Bitcoin or uh, uh, other peer-to-peer -peer decentralized technologies disruptive technologies or entrepreneurship is get them on board with the ideas of freedom because they just have a, a natural incentive to do it yes. you know if, if the dollar is is being inflated, they have a natural incentive to use Bitcoin if, or, or to use Anthem Vault in order to store their value in gold. And so I think it's amazing what you're doing. Uh, you seem like a really smart guy, and uh, I'm really glad to have had you as a guest. So once again, Anthem Blanchard, president, CEO, director uh, of Anthem Vault, uh, based out of Las Vegas. You can call them at 1-800-578-GOLD. That's 1-800-578-GOLD or 4653 Email them at anthem at anthemvault.com. And, of course, you can use the promo code James Blanchard, all one word, uh, at the sign-up and get six months free storage and 15% off dealer's margin for life. So uh, any uh, parting thoughts for us? Uh, well, I just uh, no, thank you guys very much for you know, spreading the good word and educating people about crypto and all of these you know, cool companies uh, in, in the space. And, you know, definitely encourage everyone to check out, you know, anthemvault.com. Um, and yeah, I'd love your feedback. Feel free to send us a tweet. Um, you know, you can send me one directly. Love communicating with people. So love to hear uh, your shared thoughts. So thank you all very much for having me on your program. Thank, thank you. you. We couldn't do it without guys like you. So. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, Anthem Blanchard. And uh, I guess we'll hopefully uh, return to another segment of this podcast. That's with all, folks. There you go, and there's the sounder. What does that sound mean to you, uh, Nathan? <laughs> uh, stereotypes. Oh, <laughs> man. Racist. But it also means uh, Mexico and uh, anarco poco. All right. All right. Wait, so are we recording? Yes. Oh, so welcome to the Crypto Show, guys. And we're having a, a brief little segment with a special guest here at uh, Liberty Fest NYC 2015 here on October 11th, Sunday, uh, towards the end of the second and final day of Liberty Fest with uh, Nathan Freeman. And uh, Nathan, is Freeman your real name, or are you one of those libertarians who likes to like put Freeman or Voluntarist as your last name just to, to look cool? Yeah, so I, I get that question a lot, <laughs> and, and I usually just pull out my passport because that's the name on, on my passport. Prove it. Yeah. Oh. He's really doing this. I'm not going to believe him, even if the passport says it. Even if, even if the passport says it, you need to think it's a I think he altered it. This is a counterfeit. That's what she said. There you go. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I can't attest to the authenticity of the passport. However, as far as I can tell at the moment, his last name really is Freeman. Okay. Well, then you uh, you passed the test. Excellent. Well, Nathan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm a software engineer by trade. Uh, I've been sort of on the outskirts of the Liberty Movement for a long time, been a huge fan uh, for a long time. Of the crypto show? Uh, uh, well, actually, recently, yes. <laughs> I can't say a long time, but I'm a fan, a fan of it now. Um, and uh, last uh, February was the first time I'd ever gone to any sort of a conference or an event, and uh, we went to Anarcho Poco 2015. And my, I took my whole family, and we were specifically, we wanted to move out of the U.S., and we were evaluating Acapulco as a place to go. And we went there for two weeks, and we were like, yep, we want to move here. <laughs> Just like that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And and we had a great time at the conference. It was really incredible. And, and tell us actually real quick before you get into that. Sure. You were telling me earlier today it was almost like fate. Not just that you went to the conference, but uh, tell the audience real quick, too, what had basically happened when you came back. Oh, yeah. So, well, even before we came back, we were sitting at the poolside in Acapulco, and my wife gets an email on her phone, and, and kind of foolishly, she pulls it out poolside. And, but to read it, and she goes, oh, honey, it's, it's from our landlord. 
uh, they're selling the house. We have to be out by the end of May. And but we looked at each other. We go, I guess we're moving here. <laughs> we got to move. So that's we're incredible. Here. But anyway, so you're at the you, you you're at the conference. You were there for two weeks. You said. Yeah, we we were there. We were there for two weeks. We had an amazing time. And uh, once we knew we were moving, we we went home and um, we sold everything we owned, um, and you know built a nice next a nest egg out of that. And plus eliminated a bunch of stuff, so we didn't have to figure out how we were going to move all these things. Which is always which nice. Was, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was great. I like. I didn't think that was going to be a big deal. And it turned out that was so incredibly freeing because that we no longer had to figure out what are we going to do with our stuff? We don't know. We just don't have any stuff. Yeah. We have li- what we fit in the van. And it's that's liberating. It. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hugely. Uh, and then we went on a five day drive uh, all the way down to Acapulco and we uh, put, rented a place on Airbnb that we stayed at for about uh, three weeks uh, until we found the house that we wanted to live in. And now we got a great place there. And, awesome. Yeah. Well, and tell us about just briefly your uh, experience in Acapulco last year. So uh, the conference was amazing, Um, and (laughs) it was also like really unexpected, even for Jeff Berwick. Um, So, so he basically he like put something out saying, "Hey, I want to have this conference. Would anybody come?" And a bunch of people said, "Yeah, I'd come." And so he goes, "Okay, let's see what happens." So he he took the risk and he put on the conference and he lined up speakers and everything. And for a long time, he was like, oh, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. And then like the month before it, all of a sudden, people really started buying tickets. And it turned out there were, there were 300 people there. Pretty good and turnout. It, for Yeah, a, in its first year. Yeah. For a very niche like convention all the way in Acapulco, people, right. 300 people made it out. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was great. And um, the, the, the crowd and the speakers were incredible. I mean, we had guys. We had uh, Julia Toriansky. We had Roger Veer. Um, James Corbett. James Corbett, who was amazing. Uh, we had Peter Todd come and talk about like all the vulnerabilities of the Bitcoin network. Um, it was it was really a lot of fun. Um, but as good as that part was on all those presentations, the best part was after the sun went down, everybody would show up poolside and bring beer and tequila and in ayahuasca. <laughs> yeah, no, I, don't I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> that, yeah, I wasn't around any of that. Um, that they smoked plenty though. Um, and then uh, some would get in the pool and some would go out to the beach and some would just hang out and, around and lounge around the pool. And everybody just hung out until like three in the morning. That's so cool. And then and also, the best uh, party yeah, you know, another thing, one of the better things about it is it was uh, very inclusive. Like, you know, there were th- events that were organized after, you know, the regular conference portion where, right. all right, we're all going to go over here to this bar. And like so all we would all like 150 of these all the 300 women, people would all show up at that yeah. bar. And all the women would, would go over. to one bar. All the Hispanics would go to another. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's very no diverse, but uh, you know, uh, everyone has camaraderie, and that's a beautiful part about libertarianism and anarchism. Is it's not just the philosophy; it is kind of a mindset and way of life. Like people are just, I think that your average libertarian is just a, a really relaxed, natural, open person. I think that's awesome. So that sounds like cool. I I missed last year, regrettably. Danny went, of course. But uh, I'm really excited to go again this year. And so I guess tell us a little bit about um, the upcoming event and um, your involvement in that, too. Right. So um, after after the conference last year, and by the way, Jeff doesn't even know this story. So when he listens to this, it's going to be uh, I expect to get an email um, at the end of the conference last year. I, I turned to Lisa and I said, I'm going to run this next year. Because <laughs> because it, it needs to be better run. I mean, the, the people that sort of stepped up to the plate and did it on a voluntary basis, they were amazing. Um, but we really want to bring a, a professional tone to it this time. Right. Um, we know we know a couple of them. Like Sarah, she was awesome. Oh, yeah. Sarah was fantastic. Mac Davis was was great. Um, you know, they just all worked really hard and, and got stuff done. Right. Um, but I really like I want to have real agendas like let people know what topics are going to be talked about um i want to we're going to organize a dedicated media room so that people that want to do podcasts and videos and and recordings there will have a space to do that in um we're going to have a uh, retail space so there will be books and merchandise on sale and and the people who like write the books don't have to be responsible for actually selling the books they'll just be in the retail space that'll so be really cool them. yeah yeah will there be autographed pictures of jeff berwick for sale uh, if Jeff wants to sell them, 
And, okay. You know, anybody wants to buy them? Yeah, sure. I, can I we can. draw little mustaches on them? Is, is it going to be in spandex? <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll I'll draw all the mustaches. <laughs> no, but I, I like this. I mean, it's it's beautiful. Uh, you know, as is to be expected with libertarians, that everyone kind of came together. Uh, you know, kind of at the last minute and uh, helped out and everything went well. But at the same time, you do want a lot of prep work to make sure it goes smoothly because you can't always rely on that, you know, spontaneous last minute effort. And uh, you want to make it as professional and, you know, high class and cool as possible. Yeah, so that's, that's great. That's really what we want to bring to it. I have a lot of experience in, in conference organizing in the software world. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with this kind of stuff. Sounds thrilling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but that... That means that when I look at a conference like this, I'm like, okay, what do we have to do to make this the best experience for everybody that comes? And we've uh, we've booked a, a much larger and nicer hotel. We've got a better room rate than we had last year. Cool. Uh, yeah, so it's like sixty bucks a night, and um, it's going to be uh, it's a, it's a much nicer hotel, uh, and we're expecting a much larger crowd. We're expecting at least five hundred, but we're pushing to get to like a thousand. Wow, you really are expecting at least five hundred? We're expecting at least five hundred. That's still a big you know, uh, you, turnout, even compared to last year. That would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We're missing the wild. main the main attraction. Let's run down the list of speakers. Let's do it. Yeah. So, so just Jeff, off the it, top of your head, of course, you don't have a list in front of you. <laughs> well, there's Jeff, right? If, uh, if people want to come see him speak, uh, and there's uh, Doug Casey, uh, Jeffrey Tucker, uh, Adam Kokesh, Luke Radowski, Roger Veer, um, uh, Lauren Rumpler. Um, and actually, I've been really so basically busy. basically everyone who's here right now. Well, <laughs> in a sense, yeah. I've actually been really busy organizing stuff with people here. And the, you're, I'll give you an exclusive on this. Because uh, people don't, haven't heard about this yet. But I just sort of finalized on um, Dana Martin and Brett Vanois are actually going to do a workshop together uh, at the event. And so they'll both be there. And Dana's, wow, actually, Dana's actually coming with her whole family. So the, cool. all the Martins will be there, other kids and everything. So it's going to be. Yeah, she was there last great. year too. Yeah, she was. Or this yeah. earlier this year, however you want to put. Well, it. you heard it, ladies and gentlemen. Breaking here on the crypto show. That's awesome. Uh, any other surprises? Surprise guests or anything? There's like There's still that? some more surprises, but uh, I'm not. Not at liberty. At the yeah, I can't really, liberty, can't really yeah. announce that stuff yet. What about the one I mentioned to you earlier? Was that, has that already been? No, that's not. That's not public yet. Okay. So okay. We, we can't say. Fair that. enough. Yeah, all I right. got to wait for Jeff. All right. <laughs> well, and uh, you know, I have to ask. After he leaves. I'm going to go ahead and say it. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask. I don't think this is still secret or anything, but uh, is James Corbett coming? That seems to be well, still uncertain. Wait, he, Jeff told us last time that that's, that's up in the air still. That's because up in the air? Yeah, he's, he's, well, got, I was just he's looking got a family to see matter, if, I think, that's, that's a barrier for him. Right, fair enough. I just wasn't sure if there was any update on that situation. So N- None that I've heard. I felt like I had to ask. Yeah. I just, uh, of course, headlining the place will be the crypto show. Of course, broadcasting there <laughs> live, or well, I guess we're not allowed to say broadcast. Broadcast, yeah. I said that earlier too. In coming another, to you live, coming whatever. to you uh, airing live. Can we say airing? I don't even we're, know. This is a podcast, so really streaming live. The way, it, yeah, the way it works is we're not allowed to say on air uh, that we're broadcasting. Apparently, right. that's there's some sort of issue with that because the network that we're on. We tell the government to go fuck yourself. <laughs> we have uh, the, the net. I mean, the network we're on does not have a license. It's an unlicensed network, and uh, basically, by running below fifteen hundred watts, they don't have to do it. But uh, the way they stay on air is it has been a ten-year legal battle, and that's all they do is sue the government over and over and over to stay on air. But they keep doing. It's amazing what they're doing. It's incredible that it's lasted this long. Yeah, especially I mean, with the stuff that we put out there. I mean, literally every <laughs> show is like fuck the police. You know? Yeah, really. I mean, uh, alternative out there stuff. And so one day someone should write a book or do a movie on all the efforts they've done because it's pretty incredible. Well, uh, so tell us what are some of the topics going to be and uh, what other activities are maybe planned. Well, so um, there's lots of stuff that goes on around the core conference itself. I mean, the core conference, people are going to speak on, you know, ways to get away from the state. Um, They're going to talk about Bitcoin. Those are going to be the two biggest themes. Um, But uh, there'll be uh, uh, some stuff about community building. Like if you are in a voluntarist community, how do you make that work? What are the things that what are the key things you have to do? Um, But there's uh, there's workshops beforehand. Uh, so there's mm-hmm. the, the ExoBase Entrepreneurship Workshop uh, that is, I think, on the Tuesday before, or no, the Wednesday before, sorry, uh, and the Thursday before is going to be the TDV International Investment Summit, um, which I think is now including um, Chris Casey and Tone Vase, as, mm-hmm. uh, in addition to Jeff, uh, oh, cool. speaking at that. And then um, 
There's also going to be the Luke Radowski's Change Media Change University. Media. I was actually part of that last time, so uh, you know I can speak to kind of what goes on there. He he uh, gives you basically a whole rundown of how to get your press pass, what equipment is the best equipment to to buy and easiest to use, how it operates, how to approach people, um, yeah, you know, just everything, uh, and then this whole. Uh, laughing yoga and stuff, kind of uh, tricking yourself into being a positive person when you approach these people, so that you do have, uh, you know, a good interview. And it, it was—it's definitely worth it. It's—it's it's a good thing. Plus, you get to do shots with Luke afterwards of tequila. <laughs> That's yeah. Cool. Well, you but, can do um, shots. Yeah, if, whether then, you go to whether you go to the workshop or not, you'll still get to do shots. Yeah. With Luke. And then and, and also shots with Berwick as and, well. So. And also as as what we have on our website at thecryptoshow.com slash free Ross, there's a set of tickets to Anarchapulco, and there's a set of tickets to change me to university. So you can kill two birds with one stone and help out Ross at the same time by buying these tickets. Or you can also use a promo code for how much off. Uh, you get ten percent off, and the promo code is crypto. Yeah, right? crypto. crypto. Well, but it's, it's, you have both crypto and crypto show. After the the last show, yeah, uh, I went and she enabled both codes. So oh, you okay. pick one. <laughs> crypto, okay. crypto show. Yeah, so it makes it easy. That's awesome. Yeah. So check that out, guys. Go get ten percent off, or or uh, help out Ross Ulbricht and uh, purchase that from the crypto show dot com slash free Ross. Um, and uh, then and then if I can interject. go ahead. Go ahead. So, so then uh, after the conference. There's another two-day event, and I, I don't have all the details on this yet, mm -hmm. um, but there's a, a guy, his name is Sasha, I don't know his last name, um, who was part of the pickup artist scene, and then he discovered volunteerism. Cool. And so he, like, discovered ethics, and then he looked at what he was doing, uh, you know, over here in the PUA side, and he was like, wow, that, like... What if we apply ethics to this? What does it look like? How could we? So how could sure. we find new ways to communicate with women, and, and help guys be more successful uh, well, it, with women, a, but ethically, just, but, we, but ethically, not not in this sort of the guy that way. wrote the book for that. We just re he's uh, the creator of Stash Crypto and Open Transactions. That's Chris Odom's book. Oh, which one? The uh, the pickup artist. Uh, the okay, mystery, so, so, the yeah, mystery but I'm, wait, it's yeah. Not, I'm not talking about him. This is a, another guy. Oh, then, another guy. Yeah, right, who, right. Who well, we just, uh, you know, we're just saying though that yeah. it's, it's fascinating because like uh, apparently there are these uh, uh, pickup artists who are famous in uh, in libertarian circles. But that's cool. That's interesting. Chris Odom is a, is retired. He's married now. Uh, he's retired from PUA. But uh, it was interesting that. He was this pickup artist, and now and he's this brilliant coder, Bitcoiner guy. But uh, <laughs> that's cool. I mean, that's uh, I think that's really awesome. Applying ethics to approaching women and interacting with women. That, yeah. I think it's going to be a great class. And that that's that's a two day event uh, after the conference. And then there's also another guy that's and I think Jeff mentioned this uh, last time he was on the show, who's organizing a sort of um, alternative physics and science uh, examination conference. So that sounds interesting. Like, Who is the guy? Uh, his name is David Robinson. Oh, okay. um, he lives. He's a young guy that lives in uh, Acapulco. He's part of the local expat community there, um, and he's going to have some really interesting guests talking about um, talking about like different ways to look at physics and different ways to think about stuff like gravity. Interesting. That sounds um, pretty fascinating. Is that yeah. uh, how much is that? Is that a cost? You need tickets? I, so we haven't completely settled on this, but w what I've convinced him to do. Um, is I told him you have to charge people for, for the event. Otherwise, everyone will sign up for it, and yeah, then you'll true. get a handful of people That's that show true. up. So you, get, you have to charge something to get them to commit. Um, and, but I told him, if you want, then just give away all the, uh, the proceeds for the ticket sales to a charitable cause. And he's like, oh, that's great. We'll give it to Free Ross. So, that's excellent. So that's amazing. Gonna, yeah, so he's going to charge $30 a ticket for that event, which is going to be like a, a, I think, a half-day event. Right. Um, but all the proceeds from the ticket sales are going to go to Free Ross. Excellent. Well, right. I have to well, definitely go. Definitely, wanted to put, go. Uh, I think I know who you're talking about, and I'll I'll seek him out. But make sure that he gets a hold of me so we can sure, organize yeah. it with Lynn and everything. Yeah. Well, real quick, last thing, uh, just to take a two or three minutes. Uh, tell us about uh, being an expat, and uh, you were telling me earlier how kind of easy it is in Mexico. Uh, do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I mean, I talk about every part of the way it's easy. If you if somebody really wants to know, or, come to Acapulco fair and, yeah, and yeah. buy me a cocktail, and I'll tell you. There you um, go. <laughs> but uh, but it is in fact really easy um, when you uh, when you leave the, the U.S. And, and you go to Mexico. The sort of perception that people have about what you have to do in terms of paperwork and being official and all this stuff um, is really not accurate. Um, you may or may not get your passport stamped when you cross the border. You're more likely to if you fly in than if you drive in. Um, 
if you when you get your passport stamped, they also give you a little paper card called a tourist card that records your date of entry. Um, when you leave, you're supposed to present this tourist card. Um, I've gotten them twice, and I've lost them both times. So I happen to know that when you go to leave, if you just go up to the desk and say, go up to the immigration desk and say, I'm sorry, I lost my card, then they make you fill out some papers and they charge you 330 pesos, which is like a little less than 20 bucks. And that's it. They give you a new card and you leave. Right. So, so there's no, there's not like not people, too much red tape. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. It took about 20 minutes the first time I did it. And, you know, it makes sense for neighbors. And, uh, and that's, well, that's interesting. In Mexico, I've been to Mexico. It's a beautiful country. And uh, Acapulco is pretty awesome too, right? I'm uh, sorry, I missed your question because of the rice uh, no, rocket. Just, I was saying, uh, Mexico is a beautiful place. I've been there. And Acapulco seems pre- pretty nice from what I've heard. Yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. I mean, it's, it's like 85 to 95 degrees every single day. Um, and then it, the sun goes down and it drops to, you know, around 70, 75. So it's very comfortable in the evenings. Um, it's got the, – the bay is really beautiful. Um, and uh, there's a, a really crazy nightlife. Cool. Um, so there's like stuff always going on, yeah. and and the Costera is like, way late in the morning. I mean, it's like <laughs> yeah. four a, four a.m. and they're still out there partying. It's a, it's actually kind of funny because um, it's like they don't even go to the bar till two or something. wow. So it's like the Miami of the West Coast. Yeah, yeah it's, it's they they really don't start until really late. And I didn't I this didn't happen until I moved down there. Is one night I went from my house down to the Costera like really late. It was like midnight, and right when I stepped onto the Costera, it was like the streets were jam packed. And it wasn't it wasn't American tourists. It was all um, it was all Mexican tourists. It was all people that come from, from like Mexico City oh, wow. and stuff. And it was whole families out at midnight. And they were like families walking around where moms were carrying little babies who were sleeping in their arms at midnight. While kids were running around, and they were all going for like tacos and and going to karaoke bars and stuff. I, it, I was like, where the hell was this? Because at at ten o'clock the streets are deserted. Right. It looks like they've rolled the town up. Just because they don't start until <laughs> until so like much 11. later. That's yeah. crazy. That's cool. Well, awesome. Well, we're really excited to go to not just Acapulco, but in Acapulco. And uh, I forget if you mentioned the dates, but real quick, mention the dates again. Yeah, it's uh, February 19th through the 21st. That's the official conference. And then there's workshops before and after. Okay, awesome. And, and you uh, don't even have to find the website. Just go to thecryptoshow.com. There's a banner ad there for Acapulco, and you can just click through right there, and it'll take you actually to the sign-up page, I think, is the way I have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. You get 10% off on your tickets, crypto or crypto show code. So, well, Nathan Freeman, thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we will uh, definitely see you in uh, Anarcho Polka. I can't wait. It's I can't be wait either. Absolutely. All right. All right.